Was there anything you weren't allowed to see while you were on this journey? No, there wasn't any much. Uh, I, uh, now, for instance, there was one afternoon where obviously they were going to do some special chanting or exposing special boards. Well, old, old Jenny, I think it was, nice old girl, she said, come on, Mrs. me and you two fellow, we go look our pretty flower now. And what they mean, well, look, that's the men are having a sing-song there. Well, we'll go off and, you know, what and say you're not to watch this or anything. It was all done very, very uh, gracefully and you'd just comply with whatever. If she said that, I, I wouldn't for a thousand... Pounds have said, no, I won't listen to them, not for a minute. You know, I knew that there was etiquette in the bush. There's etiquette all the time. When you got to the end of this three-week yes. trek, yes. it was to meet men from the desert. Yes, there were still a few old men that they were exchanging songs with or, or build boards or, or something. Or it might have been the remnant of an old trade route or something like that, you see. It was the, a remnant of something, I, they half were not going to do it at Moolabula. They thought, thought it was perhaps the old men won't meet them at whatever point it was. Uh, but, but they did, and they picked it up pretty quickly as we went along. There were signs of the smoke, and once they saw the smoke, they knew that the, that the men were waiting for them. And that is the occasion, that particular occasion, is when I saw the nearest thing to... And this was 1948, to what would have been... Uh, traditionally living uh, Aboriginals. This witnessing of something that was passing, something that yeah. was disappearing, did you relate to that? Did you feel that I that was land... learning? It was learning, you see. This is back in the 40s and it's been coming. You can only learn slowly. It comes to you slowly. The, 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 I'd seen it visually, the, the, the incarnateness of the... When I was doing literal paintings. I remember saying once that I don't use any other colour to, to paint the skins of the Aboriginal than what's on my brush from painting the landscape and it was always that drawing them into. That was sort of a, a visual thing and then it became more understanding the theory behind it, you see, the continuum of that Narangari, which is it's a hard concept to get because as you might be walking along, the the head of the old Goanna man would say, and, and then, then he'd go down there, you see that? He'd go down there, I'd go down, and he'd he coming out again. You, you see head there, he coming out again. And then he said, and then I go down, I'm going to have a big sleep now. And what he was interchangeable with the creature that had shaped the land because he'd, he too, he was a, a, a living Goanna man, you see, part of that landscape. Uh, and it still incarnate, you see, and that that it's so ancient that and so, it must have been so fragile that you, it, it was too easily destroyed, you see. What was it like for you being privy to this Aboriginal experience and at the same time being a member of the Durack family who had yes. done the fencing? Yes, and yes. well, so of course, my brother's a bit interesting on that, and of course, we've often discussed it because he, he's follows all the political trends and everything. As for reconciliation, he said, but they were reconciled. And I, then, I, then we might argue and I'll say, but was it reconciliation or was it resignation, Reg? He said they were reconciled to the whole thing when they came into the stations to work, you see. But uh, it, it's a bit of an open question and certainly a very vexed one at the present time. Your father sold all the Durack properties just before his own death in the 50s. Did this set you up financially? Were you able to live off your inheritance? No, I hadn't inherited any money. The, the, uh, our father died very soon after the disposal of the properties and the, the sale was heavily taxed both in Western Australia and in the Northern Territory. So there wasn't any inheritance there. So it, it was always... a um, matter of, uh, of uh, healthy hard work and planning exhibitions and, uh, and moving from one, one activity to another. I suppose it was a stimulus in a way, the very fact that I, I had to work and had to sell. As a woman and as someone who'd been well known as an illustrator, how are you accepted in art circles? 
Well, it's been a big battle. It still is. <laughs> you know, it hasn't bitted me or anything, but one of the, the worst experiences was um, uh, when I showed the Big Broom collection at uh, then David Jones Gallery in Sydney, and the next day in the, in the Sydney Morning Herald, there was a damning, a damning review in which he said, it's pretty clear that this artist is starting to uh, walk before she can crawl, and a lot of these pictures look like as though she's copied cheap reproductions of Matisse. I still didn't take it very seriously, but the fact of the matter was the exhibition died on the walls, a few drawings sold, but I hardly could pay my way back to Western Australia. You see, it was, it was a damning uh, cr criticism by a, by a man artist. <laughs> but again, that's just sort of just woven now into the rich tapestry of my failed career. <laughs> But you did, nevertheless, manage to support yourself with your art and at the same time raise a family. Where did the energy come from? Just, just good luck, I suppose. Good luck and good health, a great, great advantage. Uh, also, touching on, an, on another aspect of, of my life, which is, I won't go into deeply, uh, I, I, and it, it's almost a cliché, but I had a desperately unhappy love affair early in the North. And I think it sort of uh, shattered me to a large extent so that everything else was re irrelevant to a large extent, you know. Was, but, um, you know, that was what in, made me perhaps dislike London and being abroad so much, was that I really didn't want to go away. But I was committed to it by that time. I was committed to it. I can remember the boat pulling out from the Wyndham, from the Wyndham jetty, and looking at my tears dropping down into the muddy waters of the Gulf. But I thought I'd come back. I thought I'd come back, and and that you know that everything would work out. But I never saw him again. He was killed. How? It was a motor car accident. He was a wild boy, a very wild boy, but wonderful charm and wonderful. How did it affect the way you looked at things? I, perhaps the whole of my life is the answer to that. The whole of my life since then is the answer to that, including marriage and lovers and friends. And what do you think you did differently because of that tragic beginning. I don't think I could ever mate with anyone. That was my trouble. Perhaps the, the, the failure of the marriage was my inability to mate more than, much more than, than Frank's. Do you know what I mean? I, I could never give it completely ever again and never would and never have. Do you think that this influenced some of your later work, like the series about a disintegrating world? I see what you're getting at. Which was I describing my own? Was it was it was it autobiographical? A lot of the work, in a sense, it is, and in a in a sense, there is that feeling of 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 loss, always loss, loss. Into that, that was also something of the bonding with the Aboriginal people. Loss, a shared loss. You know, however you, you rationalise loss, loss is loss. You know. 